Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am just another tinfoil hat. Welcome to my show. Today, in keeping with December's theme of Mothman, we'll be discussing one of the most intriguing cases in the gigantic tapestry of high strangeness that comprised the Mothman scare. One of the initial and most terrifying encounters of that time period, the Partridge Affair, or Where's Bandit? Now, to get the strangest aspect of this case just out of the way, first things first, in most of the writings, Mr. Partridge is referred to as Newell Partridge. As a matter of fact, his name is actually Merle Partridge. Apparently, this was the result of a pesquiche with a birth certificate and ended up working its way into and through most of the literature, including the Mothman prophecies. So yes, in many writings, you'll see Mr. Partridge referred to as Newell. His name is technically Merle, but there was actually a clerical issue with a birth certificate that resulted in him being referred to as Newell Partridge quite a bit. So there you have it. It's actually Merle. Now, as intriguing as the Merle versus Newell debate is, a possibly even more interesting fact is that this encounter occurred the same exact night as the possibly most infamous encounter of the Mothman, the Scarberry Mallet encounter in the TNT area. Now, that actually happened about an hour and a half after Merle's encounter. So, without further ado, at around 11 o'clock the night of November 15th, 1966, Merle Partridge and his wife were watching TV in their home. The Partridge family lived on a farm in Center Point, West Virginia. So that's about 90 miles away as the crow flies, or perhaps as the Mothman flies, from Point Pleasant. So they were watching TV. If we're getting technical, it was actually the film Wild and Wonderful, which stars a French poodle, to be precise. When their set began making a loud winding noise, which Merle compared to kind of like an old army generator winding up, and the picture blanked out. Not only did the TV begin whining, but the family dog, a 110-pound purebred German shepherd named Bandit, began howling as well from outside near the front porch. As Merle went over to turn off the set and finally be done with the terrible winding type noise, the tube actually blew out, casting glass over the floor. So Merle grabbed a flashlight and sat outside, determined to find the source of Bandit's disturbance. He shone his flashlight in the direction that Bandit was howling, and it was a field that contained nothing really but a small pump house. And he picked up on red lights, which he compared to reflectors, moving around and around. He says that they were not eyes, rather they were simply these rotating, intermittent red, electrical-looking lights. The moment that the flashlight picked up on the lights, Bandit ran snarling after them. Merle called after Bandit, who typically obeyed him without question. However, this time Bandit would not heed him and, unfortunately, would never return from his adventure. Merle, like so very many experiencers of odd phenomena, initially tried to rationalize this away as something mundane. He figured that it may have been simply a low-flying helicopter. Except for that pesky issue, that said helicopter would have to be totally soundless. So the next day, Merle did go down to search for Bandit, who had not returned since the previous night, and he actually picked up on the dog's trackway, leading through the grass into a circle of smashed-down vegetation, which was right where the red lights had been spotted. Now, strangely enough, the dog's trackway never picked up again. It simply led into the circle and never back out. Now, I know I've mentioned this many times in the past, but the inclusion of dogs in so many cases of paranormal phenomena is something very interesting to me. And this case is a prime example of that. Yet again, you have a large dog which engages with the phenomenon. First, Bandit kind of drew attention to, hey, there's something weird going on out here. Then, either protecting against it or at least chasing after it, then vanishing immediately after contact. The inclusion of the tracks leading effectively to nowhere in this case is another eerie detail. It calls to mind accounts of Bigfoot or Dogman trackways, which exist only for a portion. Sometimes it's like the thing just dropped out of the sky and then totally vanished several yards later. And in this case, too, it's almost as though Bandit simply vanished into thin air. Unless, of course, he was unfortunately the large dead dog spotted by the roadside by the Scarberries and Mallets after their initial encounter, which, mysteriously enough, that dead dog also vanished before it could be identified or further investigated. Interestingly enough, dogs pop up yet again in the Mothman saga. A farmer claimed that he had several dogs mysteriously vanish in a particular stretch of field, a field where Keel often would wander and gaze at anomalous lights he referred to as his purple friends for his extensive contact with them. You may recognize this from one of my other videos, my top 10 scariest cases. And yes, I've talked about it before, but I just love that so much. Just obliviously walking through a field with some weird lights and suddenly the guy goes, oh yeah, you may want to be careful, I've lost like six animals down there. It's like, jeez. I just, I love that. Yet again, too, we have the inclusion of a, for all intents and purposes, crop circle in this case. The inclusion of crushed down vegetation is something that pops up time and time again in areas with strange occurrences, and there is a tendency to say, oh yeah, the anomaly caused that. 
whether the spinning lights in this case, or a Sasquatch bedding, or a UFO landing, or we have the old traditions of the mowing devils, or even witches. The other super neat thing is that Merle made the distinction in later interviews, as well as in newspaper articles from the day, that the lights were not eyes, but simply lights with an electrical or reflector type quality to them. You know, of course, does this mean then that they were disconnected from the Mothman with its infamous red eyes? And it's just totally coincidental that, you know, two encounters with, you know, in one case, red lights, in another case, something with red eyes occurred on the same exact day. Personally, I would err on the side of connected rather than disconnected. But of course, I personally don't think that the Mothman is a stable, physical, single being. Rather, I think it was almost a form taken by the general high strangeness occurring in Point Pleasant at that time, which I do realize sounds very vague and mysterious, but it's the best I can come up with. The other interesting thing about this encounter is the fact that Merle interacted with the phenomenon first through the use of a mundane light, a flashlight. Now, of course, yes, his TV was also simultaneously blowing up in the background, but his first engagement with the phenomenon, um, his first noticing of it, was when the beam of his flashlight hit it. And this is a detail that pops up time and time again in paranormal encounters, such as the infamous Flatwoods encounter, where, again, a flashlight beam seemed to make the creature jump into life, or even um, the encounter in Loveland Heights in the 1950s, where the woman claimed that this thing would vanish when the light was turned on inside of her home and then reappear when it was turned off. I find that intriguing because we have these paranormal entities which it seems as though one of their prime ways of interacting with us is through the use of light anomalies. However, on the flip side, it seems like one of the greatest ways that we can affect some change in their behavior is also through the use of lights. It's just that for us, it's mundane lights, such as flashlights or room lights or whatever. Finally, we have the intriguing instance, yet again, of electrical disturbances happening at the same time as an anomalous sighting. As a matter of fact, in this case, Bandit and the television both began acting up at the same time. You know, I feel like it seems really likely then that whatever the source was enacted upon both of them simultaneously. Now, yet again, cause and effect seem to lose some of their luster in the face of paranormal phenomena. But considering that animals can consistently experience a greater portion of the electromagnetic spectrum than we can, it seems to make sense to me at least that an electromagnetic disturbance may also attract the attention of our furry friends, sometimes before we even notice it. Well, if you enjoyed this video of the bandit partridge occurrence, please like, and if you're new to this field of crop circles, go ahead and subscribe to see what weirdness the future may have in store. Till then, you can keep up with whatever else I might possibly have going on on my website, justanothertinfoilhat.com, and for exclusive content, be sure to check out my Patreon page, which is also listed under Just Another Tinfoil Hat. For today, I am Celia Edgar, signing off. So one final word on the topic before I leave you all for today. I'd like to note that at the time of this initial airing, it is currently the 54th anniversary of the Silver Bridge Collapse, which has, you know, correctly or incorrectly, rightly or wrongly, been inexorably connected to the Mothman in the public mind. So I dedicate this show to the 46 people who lost their lives in that tragic event, as well as to the people of Point Pleasant, who still live in the long shadow past by the strange events of that time period, as well as that tragic loss of life. Do we?